Uh, before I get started, I guess I, I need to or should mention that at Rodale Institute, I'm really fortunate in that I get to wear a lot of hats. I, uh, I, I get to do some research, as you just heard. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of that here today. Uh, I also get to be a farmer. I, I farm at home on my own, uh, along with my son. We have uh, we milk 30 uh, certified organic dairy cows. We farm about 80 acres of cropland and, and some pasture, and then farm about 300 acres for the institute as well. So today I'm going to wear my farmer hat, partly because this lights are in my eyes, and partly because somebody last night told me you can't wear a farmer hat with a tie. And, <laughs> And I say, bullshit, I can wear what I want. <laughs> so I'd like to thank uh, the, the uh, ERS for, for inviting me and helping me to participate here today. I also wanted to thank some of the previous speakers who were so kind and generous in mentioning the work of the Rodale Institute and showing some of the images of, of our experiment that I'm going to show you some more of. And really, if, if my, my name's on this slide, but if I were to list everybody who has touched the farming systems trial at the Rodeo Institute, it would be like a third of the people in this room and then a list many times greater. Um, lots of folks have come through the Rodeo Institute and put their fingerprints and handprints all over this experiment and none of the data that I would be showing you here today I would be able to do um, without their work. The other thing that I want to mention is, you know, my title, I changed the title from what I was given to, to speak about. Uh, that's kind of what happens when you invite me to speak. I want you to notice, if you will, this word right here, because I'm going to concentrate on that just a little bit in my talk, the fact that I personally think we're dealing today with an extremely flawed food system. And until we recognize that, all the research that we're talking about here today, you know, doesn't mean a whole lot. We talked yesterday about farmer adoption and uh, adoption rates and why more farmers aren't picking up on it, and I think we'll touch on that a little bit today, too. Uh, my grandmother lived to be 96. And she told me, she said, Jeff, the only advantages there are to getting older is you can say whatever you want and nobody can stop you. Now, I'm not 96, but I'm older than a lot of folks in this room and I intend to say what I want and nobody can stop me. <laughs> I was already instructed by a timekeeper, she has no authority. <laughs> Let's start talking about why our food system is flawed. Well, I started thinking about history. I wanted to go back in the history of farming systems trial to go to the beginning. I mean, it's pretty hard. Our trial has been there for 30 years now. This year we celebrate our 30th anniversary. Uh, some of you in this room will be getting invitations. Uh, if you don't, look on our website and come and visit us for a, a special event that we're going to be having at our plots. So I went back in history and I went a little further than, than when our project started. I went back to uh, 400 BC and wanted to look at what the major flaw is in our food production system and it is that we have as a general uh, bunch of agronomists and farmers we have taken the soil right out of the equation that is a huge huge flaw starting with our experiment we started in 1981 in about 1980 a report came out from the USDA under Garth Youngberg that said, you know, there's a, there's a big issue that farmers have with transitioning to organic. Seems like we still have that issue here 30 years later. Uh, but during the mid, uh, mid to late 70s, Bob Rodale was traveling down to Washington, D.C. He was meeting with politicians, and he was trying to change the way funds were being allocated to do work across the country. And he kept bumping up against people that said, you know what, you don't have any science. Show us the science. We need to see the science. So he came back to the Institute and he said, Let's create some projects here and show people some science. They want to see science. We know it works. Uh, he said, but don't do a comparative study. And we heard yesterday that many of the long-term studies that are out there today are thinking about removing the uh, conventional treatment from their, their experiment. And that's what Bob said. I don't want to do any conventional treatments. We already know it works. Well, we said, you know, you know it works, and I know it works, but they don't know it works. So. Let's put that, that into our system. So we had, in 1981, we started our farming systems trial. And again, it has spawned a lot of the research that we've heard about today. This experiment was really designed to be a fe feasibility study to look at the transition process in converting a farm. And in fact, the, the very first years, it was called the conversion experiment, because we were trying to convert from 
a traditionally uh, chemical intensive farming system into one that was organic. And in fact, we rented a piece of land at that time. We didn't own it because we wanted something that had been farmed chemically or, or conventionally for a long time. And so we rented a field that had been in continuous corn for 25 years. I will say that the field across the street that's still being farmed by that farmer is still being farmed in continuous corn. So he's got over 50 years of continuous corn. And what we really wanted to do was look at or, or demonstrate that we had the potential with organic systems to not only produce high yields of crops, which we've heard about in all the experiments that have been talked about here uh, in the last couple of days, but also improve the soil and the water as we did it. So we'll concentrate a little bit in talking about those environmental impacts. Our farming systems trial was started in 1981. It's got three cropping systems. Fortunately for us, when we first set this experiment up, we gave ourselves eight replications. More than we needed. Uh, I'm glad they're all there. Three crops are represented in each of the years, so we had three, uh, three points of entry into each rotation. Even though some of the rotations had more than three crops, uh, we only had three points of entry. Our main plots are 60 feet by 300. Uh, the subplots are 20 by 300. These are the three systems that we have in place. We started them in 81. They're still there today. We have an organic manure-based system. We have an organic legume-based system. And we have a conventionally uh, chemical-based system. Let's look at each of those systems a little bit individually. I'm going to try not to bore you with too much statistics and data, although if you want me to, I will. Uh, the manure system is really designed to represent an organic dairy or a beef operation. It features long rotations that have both annual feed crops and, in this case, forage crops. And it's really the, the fertility system, which was the big question that farmers had in that report by Garth Youngberg, was, what are we going to do for nitrogen? Everybody knows that to be an organic farmer, you have to have animals on your farm. Therefore, if you don't want animals, you can't be organic. It's kind of a Monty Python sort of thing, but it works. So we said, OK, let's assume that's true. We're going to create this manure-based system, and we're going to use both legumes in the form of forages, uh, like alfalfa, and we're going to have manure, and then we, we have all these other things going on. But we didn't believe that was true. We said, yes, animals are nice. It makes the system a lot easier to manage from a, from a practical standpoint, but it's not biologically necessary, because we can get all the nitrogen we need from legumes. So we created an organic legume system. It has a little bit shorter rotation than the livestock system, and it does not have any uh, forages in it. And the sole source of fertility in terms of nitrogen uh, comes from the uh, legume crops. And then we have a conventionally uh, based system. And for this system, because we're not a land grant, we follow Penn State recommendations for the uh, fertilizer and uh, herbicide uses that have been going on in that experiment for the last um, 30 years. And it does rely on synthetic nitrogen for its fertility source. So what are the differences between the cropping systems? Well, you know, we've, we've got some crop diversity. There are differences we're measuring. Living ground coverage, the amount of time that there's something living and growing on the, on the soil, fertilization type, and certainly uh, weed control methods. And this is just a list of some of the kinds of things that we're trying to capture in terms of data on those on those plots. And it's very similar to what, you, what you've heard today. And I think if we expand in the future, it's going to be on this lower one, looking at the uh, nutritional values of, of grains. This is just a field map that that's, uh, depicts kind of the, the, the plots as they, as they lay out in the, in the field. And really, when this experiment was started, it was farmer driven. The plots are designed to use farm scale equipment. Many of the new uh, plot projects that are started out there are much the same. You saw that yesterday. That's because while the information is really interesting to researchers, when you wear your farmer hats, it becomes a lot more interesting. And you know, part of the frustration that I had yesterday was, and even today, when we heard that uh, there's going to be, what, 9 billion people, because everybody's busy out there doing what we do as people. Uh, there's going to be 9 billion of us out there that we have to feed. Yeah, I was talking with a, with a neighbor just last summer. <clears throat> he farms about 1,400 acres of 
corn and soybeans, which for us in, in eastern Pennsylvania is, is a decent sized farm. And we were talking about feeding the world. And he said, you know, Jeff, I, I'm really interested in feeding my family. I'm not really overly concerned about feeding the world. And in fact, I don't really produce any food anyway. I produce corn and soybeans. He said, corn is for ethanol. Corn is for high fructose corn syrup. Soybeans can be oil for printing or anything else. Nobody has ever asked me to produce food. Hmm. He was right. You know, he said, if, if, if I was asked to produce food, I would do what you do over at your farm. For example, we have a CSA on our farm that takes up eight acres. I told you I can talk about whatever I want when I get up here. We have a CSA that takes up eight acres of land on our farm. And we feed 225 families for half a year, all they can eat. We give them too much. And there's still leftover to sell to some restaurants, and, uh, and we send the, the real excess to a uh, produce auction. Eight acres, 225 families. 1,400 acres next door to me doesn't produce any food. So when we talk about these things, we really have to be uh, conscious of, of what it is that we're, that we're thinking about, what we're instructing farmers uh, to do. Let's look a little bit at yields. Uh, basically, over, uh, over a 29-year period in the trial, uh, the yields are pretty much the same. We can, we can grow as much with organic systems as we can with, with conventional systems. Uh, what's really interesting, this pointer seems to have died. What's really interesting is that whenever we have a drought year, or a year that's too wet, the organic systems perform better. This is what's what averages out those 29 years, because there are some years that the conventional system produces a lot of grain. I tell everybody it's a little bit like a thoroughbred racehorse. When the track is right, that puppy can run, and there's nothing going to catch it. But how often is the track perfect? I don't know what it's like on your farms or research plots, but for us it's always either too wet or too dry. When it's too wet and it's too dry, that old plot horse organic just keeps plugging along, and you can take that to the bank. And uh, I think there's, there's a lot of, of valuable information in that when we talk to farmers. You know, let, let, let's talk a little bit about some, some soil results. Uh, what we're seeing is increased uh, carbon sequestration. Uh, the soil nitrogen levels are, are, pretty, much, uh, are pretty much the same. They're going, they're going up in the organic. And, and the soil increases were greatest in terms of carbon sequestration in the first 13 years. We didn't plateau after one or two years. We kept going for about 13 years, and then it did slow down. But it is still gaining, uh, gaining some momentum. Now, if you look at the soil, and getting back to that first slide that I showed you that said we have a flawed food system, and we don't think about the soil, those two soils in, in Dr. Ray Wiles' hands from the University of, of uh, Maryland came from, a, from plots five feet apart from each other. This was after about 15 years of, of farming in our farming systems trial. Those same two soil clumps, they weren't the exact ones, but are put in those two aquariums. Look what we're doing to our, our conventional soils when we farm them. Um, I wish the pointer worked. The aquarium on your right is the conventional soil, the other one is the organic soil. So when we get these heavy rains, when we get this, this washing, why, why, why is Iowa washing down the, the river and heading out in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, look at what happens to the soil when we farm it conventionally. We're killing our soils, we're killing ourselves, and we're, we're substituting short-term yields for long-term soil loss. And then we call that sustainable. Well, I mean, Monsanto calls that sustainable. They're the sustainability people. Uh, I think that ad campaign cost more than $19 million, which is the table scraps we've been thrown to divvy up and fight among ourselves on the floor. Uh, thank you. And while $19 million is better than what we had, and we are making improvements, uh, it's, it's not enough. We're, we're, we're not doing what we need to be doing if we want to actually feed people. I'm going to jump along real quick here because I just got the five-minute signal. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot. You have no authority. Um, soil carbon levels, 
It's, it, this, this chart is a little bit deceiving because in our nine replications, I'm sorry, eight replications in the plot in our field, two of those replications of the conventional system are in a very shaly area. So if you take those two plots out, that little blue dot moves up between the red and the green one. So basically they're all starting from the same point. And the blue line is pretty much flat. It really hasn't increased at all. And the other two have. I'm going to jump along real fast here because I want to show you some of the things that we've designed and put into our system. We have some intact soil core lysimeters that are in our, in our plots, so we have plenty of opportunity to collect water data. Uh, here, here's an example of, of a drought. This happened to be 1995. The conventional corn on the right was planted two weeks earlier than the organic corn on the left. And when we first planted it, our field foreman said, damn, I wish the organic corn would look as good as the conventional corn. Six weeks later, he said, damn, I wish the conventional corn would look as good as the organic corn, because we don't want to see anything not do well. It didn't rain more on the left. <laughs> the same thing was true in 2005. Um, I'm going to jump along, because I know I'm running out of time. Uh, energy results, were, again, just like everybody else, we, we're using less energy to produce organic systems. I'm going to jump through here. Diesel unit, unit equivalents, this is not from FST. This is from a, a, a set of data that we did with Dave Pimentel up at, uh, at Cornell. But what we're able to document very clearly is that as we move to organic systems and even organic no-till, which is what I want to finish up with, we can take 70% in some cases of the amount of energy that it takes to produce corn out of the equation. So we're improving the soil, sequestering more carbon. We're almost equal in yields. We're saving energy, and people aren't adopting it. They're, they are adopting. I mean, it's relatively fast, 20% growth. That's pretty much cancerous growth in, in most industries. We saw yesterday on the slide, I believe Kathleen Dellett showed it, that even in an economic downturn, we saw a, a 5 to 7% uh, growth. And some, in some ca categories, it was more like 9 to 11. So we know that we can, we can make more money and that more farmers are moving into it, but it's not fast enough. I'm going to jump through all of these slides. Uh, and I apologize to the, uh, to the webinar folks for jumping around like this. They have to tolerate me as well as you. Uh, Long-term corn yields, you know, almost, almost the same. No real good statistical differences and always, uh, you know, pretty much above county averages, except in 2010. Now, what's happening is we're changing our treatments over time. We heard a little bit about that yesterday. If we expect these long-term trials to be, remain relevant, they must be dynamic. How do we handle that, that dynamic nature? I'm not sure in each of your experiments, but in ours, we have really made our systems much more complex. We took those eight reps in 2008, and we divided them in half because it was really clear that the industry on a whole, whether it's organic or conventional, is interested in moving into no-till. So we now have no-till and uh, plow-till treatments. In the conventional, it's chisel plow. I uh, need to give Matt Ryan, who's in the audience, some credit for a lot of the weed work and the weed data that was there. And unfortunately, I'm going to buzz through it, Matt, like you can't believe. Um, what's interesting is we can see from some of the data that we're collecting on weeds that the impact of farm operations, that's my impact, on, on, the, uh, on the process can have more effect than the, than the rest of the treatment of the system itself. For example, in 1997, working with our research team, we said, you know what, we have to reduce tillage in these plots and treatments. So we started to chisel plow. When we started chisel plowing in the organic system, and there's lots of other confounding uh, pieces of information there, but we see our, saw our weed populations across the farm because it was easy, and we said, oh, we like easy, uh, just like conventional farmers. You ask them why they spray Roundup, it's not because they make more money, it's because it's easy. When did farming get to be easy? I don't know, but that's what we're fighting for is to make it easy. So, you know, we wanted it easy, and we chisel plowed, and over a period of time across our farm, not just this FST data, we saw our weed dynamics, our weed shifts go way out of whack. So we have to be careful how we interact with our farming system. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. There's where we started putting the chisel plow in. I'm going to jump through all this because I want to finish up with a little bit of a conversation about tillage. Because as I mentioned, tillage can be a problem. Um, I don't know whose tractor that is. It wasn't mine. I don't know how they get that out of there. 
But why can't all of our farming systems, whether they're conventional or organic, look like this? Why doesn't, when the snow's melting off of Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin and, and Nebraska, I try not to say Iowa because I pick on them a lot, why don't they look like this, whether they're conventional or organic? It's because we don't incentivize it. We've never told farmers, we want you to improve your organic matter content of your soil. We've told them, like my neighbor said, you pay me to produce as many tons of yellow stuff as I possibly can, as cheap as I can, and that's why you get what you got. And I don't think we should be satisfied with that. Thank you.